Uh, thanks for being here. I'm going to try to keep this short, but when I introduce the Astor, I'd like to begin at the beginning. Um, Mark and I met him two and a half years ago at the Alliance for Artist Communities Conference in Seattle. Uh, the Astor was there because he had actually established a residency program in his home for one artist. It was an extremely dynamic first conversation. Um, we began talking together kind of pretty feverishly about the ways that he could think about Omaha and the ways that we could begin to do a project together. Um, in that two years since then, Fiesta has in a way been collecting uh, buildings, collecting homes um, in St. Louis and in Chicago and, and programming these spaces. Um, he'll talk more about that. But I think the thing that excites us is the way that he looks at abandoned space as a resource and begins to ask questions about the city um, that, that are at the core about reimagining what, what's possible. Also, when we began talking about the idea of a project, he said, well, it, it begins with a process. I have to come there, I have to talk to people, I have to meet people. I have to know what the needs are of the black artist community in Omaha. So that's what we've been doing on this visit and the previous visit and subsequent visits. It's some of what we'll do tonight. Um, I think there's a real opportunity for, for feedback and questions tonight. Um, a couple things about him. He's the current uh, director of arts programming in the office of the provost at the University of Chicago. He's also a Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Um, recent solo exhibitions at the Milwaukee Art Museum. This is an exciting night for us. I think it's an exciting night for, for all of you. I'm glad you're here, and let's please welcome Theaster.
but let's cut down to it. That it really, clay needs skillful hands. What was beautiful about potters back in the day was that it wasn't one set of hands that were responsible for a beautiful pot. In some places, 12 hands might touch a pot. That there was like a, an accumulation of skills that would all converge on this one little four inch thing. A family that specializes in gold enamel. Somebody that specializes in the creation of a particular kind of porcelain with a kaolin from a very particular place. Maybe their land was on that place. That clay had all these uh, specializations. And that it was the accumulation of skills that led to really beautiful things. I like that. That, that I found that the possibility in a place has everything to do with the limitations of my skill or how willing I am to like push a particular skill set. So I don't know exactly what kind of artist I am. I think less about that word and more about skill sets, more about relationships. Right? And it's unfortunate that people come along and canonize ways of thinking sometimes. So it's like, oh, the Astor, you're a social practitioner. Or you're a, you're a relational athlete. You know, that um, all of a sudden having dinner has to mean something. I really just needed people to use my pots. That's why I convened, right? That's why I convened dinners. At first it was just like, how can I get these crazy folk who won't come to a folk art fair to, to want me? to want my wares, my bowls, <laughs> my jars. <laughs> I found myself wanting to figure out a way to um, uh, grapple with this material. And there were moments when the material wouldn't quite let me do what I wanted to do. That I found myself wanting to talk about the challenges of cities, the challenges of uh, uh, the lack of use of things available, raw material, leftover things, food, bodies of knowledge. Clay was my only medium for a long time. And I was like, maybe I'm ready to move out of the realm of the gestural uh, and into the real. The dinners then started to, to allow me to ask the question, if I got all these people in one place, what could I do with them? What could we do together? That, that didn't feel like an art practice as much as uh, a kind of deep calling. That like, when you have the most powerful cultural leaders in a city, in one room, they ask her, what do you do with them? When you have the most creative minds that could live in Omaha who chose to say, what do you say? There were raw materials around me and I was trying to figure out how to redeem them. I wanted to uh, uh, take these objects, these objects from the Wrigley's Chewing Gum manufacturing plant, conveyor pallets that had been left for 20 years, uh, when Wrigley's moved out of the neighborhood. First to the west suburbs, then NAFTA, uh, places in Mexico, and then places in China. That these factories, Wrigley's kept making gum, they just weren't doing it on the west side of Chicago anymore. I wanted to talk about these brown boards and the brown hands that had touched them last and the olive-colored hands that had touched them before the brown hands, and then the kind of nicely uh, uh, burnt red hands that finally touched them, brothers, burnt from the sun of Mexico. But the boards uh, became a way of talking about the story of a brown neighborhood uh, that had been forgotten. Uh, uh, 
raw material forgotten, unused, dying, shat upon, little rodents building penthouses of these stacked wareboards. I wanted to redeem the boards, and as a way of redeeming the boards, I could like be metaphoric, gestural, talk about the problems of the big white city and its relationship to the brown city. I would stage these performances inside of museums and talk about uh, where those boards came from. Right down the street from Wrigley's Chewing Gum was Shine King, a beautiful little shoe shine stand where like lots of people would go and it was kind of like church. Nobody ran because the space wasn't big enough. But preachers went there, you know? Pimps went there, you know? CTA, Chicago Transit Authority bus drivers went there, right? I wanted the Museum of Contemporary Art to know where these materials came from. So I called it a shine temple, but I refused to shine shoes there. If you wanted your shoes shine, you had to go to the west side of Chicago. If you take Chicago Avenue bus to 66 straight down, about 45 minutes later, you could get to Chicago Avenue and Central. If you walked six blocks south, you could get to Lake Street. But nobody who normally goes to the Museum of Contemporary Art would necessarily want to do that. So how do I create a kind of fetish moment, a moment where whatever you would normally want to do or choose to do, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's interrupted by this other thing that's so loaded, so powerful, that you find yourself fighting your fear of the black west side, fighting your fear of what happens if I get off at this stop versus the next stop, fighting your fear of like the potential violence or the last uh, newscast that you heard about what happens on the west side, fighting your sense of what drug dealers do and crack addicts do, what prostitutes do in alleys. That this temple project gave me an opportunity to defend my neighborhood. For the first time, something good for me was starting to emerge out of a place where most of the city didn't want to be. After the project left the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, I was asked to be in the Whitney Biennial in 2010. This time, instead of having to buy a space and put my little temple inside and then be given a nice space at the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, now they were paying me to bring my temple to the courtyard of the Whitney. It was a lot of space. Um, it gave me room to kind of develop a, a, a sacred space, a kind of full temple yard. And the piece was called Cosmology of Yard, like everything that happens in my life happened on my block. And that that was my cosmos. I wanted to talk about parameters and boundaries, limitations, you know. Um, internalized boundaries, externalized created boundaries, right? That the cosmos was just about 4,000 square feet. Right? What was beautiful about this was that it gave me an opportunity to really kind of see the material fully redeemed in the cultural sphere, that they went from rat shit to the Whitney Biennial in about three and a half years that felt like redemption, you know? And I went with them. Right? And I went from a, 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 an artist that had no footing in the cultural sphere to one that could like start to negotiate things. I thought, what do you do uh, when culture confers that it's okay for you to do things and say things and act on things? What a lot of people do is you get a bigger studio. You know, you, you cash in, you make some money, you buy a nice house, um, you can now buy better paints, you can afford assistance, you can travel more, you can be in a nice hotel when you stay in New York. But I had these, uh, this other burden, that at the same time that the Whitney was happening, projects were growing in places like North St. Louis, where I'm being asked to respond to Gordon Matta Clark 
and then I go to the north side of St. Louis and I see these buildings and I'm like, oh, I could just take the whole building, slice that motherfucker off, put it in the Pulitzer and be good. <laughs> I'm like, uh, John the engineer, John, can we just cut it in half, slice it off, crane it up? That I got to this neighborhood in North St. Louis and I was, I was uh, teaching a class to seventh graders. And I was saying, you know, guys, I had this really great opportunity to you know, think about these buildings and do really cool things with them. I think I'm going to slice one up and move it over to the Pulitzer. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and uh, the kids were like, you know, well, that's cool because people always take stuff from my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> they like, where do you think that brick went? <laughs> And, and I started, the, the, the seventh graders started teaching me things that there were these guys that they called brick eaters. And the brick eaters would come, burn the rafters, burn the roof and the rafters, so that the rafters would uh, become loosened from the brick. And then they could kick the parapet, the wall would tumble, and then at night, they would like take brick, clean them up, right? And then the, the brick eaters would palletize those. And the pallets, the, the bricks, would then go to the dude who owned Colonial Brick Company. <laughs> so, now the black dudes would get arrested, right? And policemen would say, you know, the Astro, I'm so tired of these, you know, fucking crackheads, you know, always, you know, this is a shame, this is their neighborhood, they're a disgrace. You know, and Mr. Colonial Brick Manufacturer Man gets to make hundreds of thousands. He's a he's a he's the great philanthropist of the Pulitzer Museum. Yeah. He's the guy that gets to be generous, Mr. Colonial Brick Manufacturer motherfucker. Excuse me, like we got kids in this room. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We're in Omaha. <laughs> Hesse, Mark, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, kids. <laughs> what do you do with this? You know? Excuse me. I wanted to leverage the cultural moment that I was experiencing and the resources that were potentially flowing my way, either through the sale of art objects or other art collectors who wanted to be generous or sympathetic toward my projects. And, and be a kind of conduit toward more ambitious projects. This has everything to do with my ego. This is not altruistic. I don't care what Hesse says, ain't nobody doing this work because they just are good people. <laughs> that, that the leveraging allowed me an opportunity to um, ask other people, what should we do in particular places? And the urban planner in me was like, well, what happens if instead of getting a better old raggedy house, if I stayed in the same old raggedy house that I had and just allowed myself to grow in that particular place, why don't I just stay where I'm at? And so uh, in Chicago, you know, I had my little building. It was a single story candy store. I could like work in the front, live in the back. I could have little parties, everything was nice. It was really awesome. And then two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, the market crashed. Um, people who had been recipients of Section 8, their vouchers moved to the south suburbs. I believe here in Omaha, the voucher takes you to the west suburbs. That people were being exported, and other people, and that exportation was allowing for a particular kind of urban renewal. <laughs> Things are changing around here. Right? And I was curious about what, like, in this liminal moment, who buys? You know, who's selling? Who's renting? Right? And how could we take advantage, of, how could artists, how could I take advantage of this moment where things are kind of in between to ask questions about what these buildings could become? So this building was next door to the house that I live in. Um, when I, when I moved there, the building had a value of $240,000. Uh, in the moment when I bought it, I acquired it for $16,000. Um, I responded to an email, a Craigslist message that said, help me save my marriage. 
um, please take my barn wood. Bought this dude's barn wood, took off the bottom cladding, you know, put this new siding on, and then I had a farmhouse. <laughs> it was like, I didn't have to go anywhere. I had 12, 50 lots next to me. It's like, this is prairie style. <laughs> this Frank Lloyd Wright, baby. <laughs> Little house on the prairie. <laughs> My mama helped me buy the building. I didn't have any money to do anything but gut it. So after I gutted it, I was like, well, since I'm broke, let me just create some performances inside of it. Let me ask some people to come and like look at the building. We had sweeping performances. You know, it's like, that's what white people do. They come. Like, I'm going to like, I'm going to do some performance art. I'm going to take my clothes off and I'm going to sweep. And it's going to be called sweeping. Thank you. And so we would, we would sweep and we would have dinners and um, we would have lectures like the Sunday morning sermons, you know, these sermons on the city is what we call them. And it would be like an architect and would come and talk about bloom framing or something like that. Or like kids from the uh, Art Institute or folk from IIT, folk would come and like, you know, hang out. Um, a little bit of cash started flowing in. I sold my first big piece. I sold some shoe shine stands. It was amazing. It was awesome. And so I thought what I'd do is um, try to give you guys a sense of the kind of ecology of things, right? So uh, you buy a building, and uh, it has a lot of problems. So you tear off the problems, and you keep all the raw material. Um, you turn the raw material into some kind of contemporary seeming looking art form and you ask, you pray hard and you ask your gallery to try to sell it. Um, so all of the stuff is encased in those Donald Judd, Juddian looking things. The carpet is on the right side. And we, you know, we, we tried to do things with it. You know, we would take uh, the baseboard and the crown molding and try to, try uh, with the potter's care, to do as much as we could to make them uh, loaded, racialized, uh, enigmatic, fetishistic, seductive uh, objects for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and then those objects would move through an art fair, uh, like this is at the armory just now, and, and you, leverage, you leverage your cultural capital and that hopefully, hopefully turns into a sale, and then that resource is used to trick out the rest of the building, <laughs> right? To buy a library from the bookstore that's going out of business, to buy the, 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 the soul albums at Dr. Wax, you know? So I found myself with a little extra cash, so I was like, well, I don't know what to do with the money, I'm gonna, I'm gonna renovate the building, right? Let's rid of it. I mean, people do this all the time. You know, they're learning all these things from all these people. So I bought the bookstore. Now the cool part, the cool part about buying the bookstore uh, is that it was Prairie Avenue Bookstore, which was a really important art and architecture bookstore uh, in the South Loop. I knew that if I bought Prairie Avenue, certain kinds of people would be really, really excited to come visit uh, the bookstore on the south side, wherever the bookstore was. If I made the books public, right, it's that catalytic moment. It's that like, what do you do? How do you leverage? What's the fulcrum? How do we make the most of this? That I, I told Bill Hasbrook, the owner, Bill, if you give me this collection, I'll make it a reading room in your honor. I'll talk about it like, I won't covet it. I'll, I'll make it public and the world will know about it. And it's just like, I just like to gossip. I like to brag, I like to gossip, it's all ego. And so now it's awesome because like, people from other countries want to come visit this Prairie Avenue bookstore. He had a collection of Viennese, Schninkel is like a old school architecture firm, like 1870s, and they make these beautiful drawings. And I had this box of Schninkel, I don't even, I can't even pronounce it right, I'm probably saying, I don't even know what I have. And this guy, this guy comes over and he's like, yeah, so do you know what this is? Do you know what this is worth? 
right? And all of a sudden, the South Side had something to offer that no place else in the city had, right? And it's like, well, I ain't giving this to the Newberry Library. I'm not giving this to no, this is Dan, this is our cultural asset, people. Oh, I should say then, finally, uh, after that was done and some newspaper articles happened, then the Chicago Housing Authority was really excited about this new kind of affordable, creative, artist-inspired initiative and the, the one small project that required a tremendous amount of my own personal investment and seed led to a 36-unit uh, restoration of uh, uh, former uh, Chicago Housing Authority complex that will, in two years, become an intentional artist community. We, we can get into that. That it went from me doing a small gestural, going from a clay pot gestural to a single piloted house gestural to uh, potentially having an impact on how affordable housing dwellers live in my neighborhood. That, that I'm trying to make the projects more and more real. Doesn't necessarily mean bigger and bigger, it just means like more and more people benefit from, like I don't really know how many black people who haven't graduated high school would be super excited about Prairie Avenue Bookstore being on my block. So maybe the bookstore ain't for them. Maybe that's, that's just to like, uh, uh, it's like a worm and a hook. It's like really to get designers and architects and folk from the outside excited about the work. Like in conversation with my neighbors who just come over because we want to share meals together. That I'm trying to create these spaces where people feel like uh, either by geography or interest, there's a reason for us all to be there. I'm, I'm talking about Omaha. I'm not really talking about Chicago, y'all. So we restored a building in St. Louis. We finished the first building in Chicago. It was like, this is, this is OK. You know, this is fun. And then there were people in Chicago who were real developers, not pretend developers, who were saying, well, the Astro is a really interesting model. Is it scalable? You know, is this something that you could do in other cities? You know, is this? So I was like, no, nah, man. You know, this is really about localness. This is about me belonging to a place and really believing in a place and um, digging deep, right? So part of the problem that I have, part of the problem that me and Hesse have, it, as we think about what's possible in North Omaha is that like, I can't run it. That, that it will innately fail anything I do if it's not run by North Omahaans. How do y'all say that? That's right. Members of the community? Yes. That, that if it's not run by members of the North Omaha community. <laughs> um, the first project went well in St. Louis. The school down the street from the project that we completed said, if you're into abandoned buildings, we got a couple other, you know, maybe, maybe we can give you one. So they ended up giving me the building on the right. Um, the school, the, the, the Holy Trinity had owned the building for like 10 years and they were just trying to keep it, keep, keep it boarded up and safe from people using it to do deviant activities. Uh, no ambition to renovate it or restore it, just to stabilize the block. They didn't have the resources. And so uh, after getting ownership of the building, I said, well, maybe this is a conversation that the city could help me think about. Maybe I can pull out my brooms again and start sweeping. Uh, until something happens. And so um, over time, uh, I was able to get in touch with the, the head of architecture at Wash U uh, in St. Louis, a guy named Bruce Lindsay, who helped run Rural Studio in Auburn, Alabama, you know, out of, out of Auburn. And he was looking for a city project in St. Louis, but he didn't have the right conduit, he didn't have an organizational structure that he could go through to be part of the community. <clears throat> like he needed folk that had relationships with aldermen, relationships with neighbors, ways of getting the whole community excited about this project. You can't just like land an architecture program on an abandoned building. And so there I was kind of acting as the conduit um, uh, for Wash U School of Architecture. So now we have an abandoned building this summer, 18 students, $50,000 from Wash U, 
additional resources from the Emmy Pulitzer, um, and a commitment to seeing the life of this building grow over time. And, and the school needs a practice site. They need to teach kids how to design and build. Like, I'm just connecting, instead of them like building uh, blank walls and tearing them down and rebuilding them, you know, instead of like practicing, why not like use a real building that could have substantial impact in a real neighborhood? Um, in my building in Chicago, uh, the University of Chicago was getting ready to uh, uh, de-accession, de-accession, de de-accession, is that the word? Fuck. What, I'm sorry, excuse me. What's the, thank you, that word. They were getting rid of their glass lantern slides. And um, they called me because they knew that I liked old things. So they were like, well, you know, we're... We have these slides and they're uh, really beautiful and nobody wants them. We're going to have to get rid of them. Maybe we'll have to dump them. It's $4,000 to dump them. Maybe we could move them to your place. So I go, and it's like the entire history of art. Like between 60 and 80,000 glass lantern slides. It's like, I could start a school. <laughs> this is awesome. And there I was again with, a, with a, another loaded fetish object that could mean nothing to the people in my neighborhood, could mean a lot to other people outside my neighborhood. How do I use my house as a place where this archive could get activated? So I took the archive and took you know, $4,000 worth of structural engineering fees, $15,000 worth of structural work, new footings, you know, I wanted to have really beautiful wooden beams, so it was like a day of hauling big beams. But, the, but now it's like a beautiful space, it's pretty awesome. And I had to get clever then about its use. So I commissioned a black preacher and an art historian to think about uh, images of the Christ in the medieval section of the archive. How do you start to take these materials and make them living for the communities that you hope to serve, right? Just one more note about this 36-unit building. It's two blocks away from the a block away from the work that I'm currently doing in Chicago. Um, I've never done a big a project this big, um, but I thought you know. Uh, I could call, I got a thousand dollars in the bank now. <laughs> I could call an architect who charges $125 an hour, at least get it for like, what, seven, eight hours. <laughs> so I called up this woman, Catherine Baker, and said, Catherine, can you dream with me about the possibility of these 36 units becoming an intentional artist community? And she said, yeah, you know, let's, let's, let's dream about it, the answer. So I went, told her my ideas, and she said, you know, you should really talk to Rich Sorrentino, who's the master developer for the Chicago Housing Authority. He does a lot of affordable housing, and he just got this big grant to do some artist housing uh, on the opposite side of town. This would be a really good opportunity, now that he's gotten all these tax credits, to do something that might benefit people who actually really need it. <laughs> you might want to erase that. <laughs> he's a good guy. And so Rich was able to schedule a meeting with me and the Chicago Housing Authority. We pitched the idea, and now we're moving forward with this you know, $4.5 million project where we'll be able to leverage some of the TIF funds that an individual artist would have never been able to access you know, because there's this other mechanism that makes money available and not available to different kinds of people in a particular kind of place. Omaha. Yesterday, Hesse and I uh, went to Great Plains Black History Museum. Beautiful building on the outside. Uh, it's a shell of itself. I feel really passionate about the restoration of the Great Plains Black Museum. There are archives there that are important to all of us in Omaha, all of us in this country. 
there were things that were, there were black things happening in Omaha before I knew there was whiteness. It's like, it's been happening a long time, ain't it, Jim? Where Jim at? You know, um, remember that. We got the Great Plains Historical Museum. Right? We got, and I'm going to talk about these buildings. Uh, there are buildings that are unoccupied, right? In varying states of disrepair with varying need. Now, this is Theaster, the artist planner, artist planner, planner artist. Um, how can we think about some of the empty spaces in North Omaha in relationship to all of this amazing knowledge in Omaha? As we're thinking about the restoration of the Great Plains Museum, how can we use a temporary space to celebrate those? a place like this? Oh my God, Mark, maybe a place like this. Maybe a place like the Carver Bank. Maybe a place like this cute little building on 24th Street. How can we think about these interstitial spaces that are, that are not part of somebody's master plan that could be activated pretty easily by like putting some new storefronts in them? How can we start to think about the artists in North Omaha and their needs and make spaces available, right? And so I started quickly dreaming with Jim about, well, Jim, you know, what else could the, the Great Plains Museum be? Could it, you know, Jim had ideas, you know. Um, how could we use, leverage the historical tax credit or new market tax credit to make some of these things happen? How do we make more space readily available? Brigitte, how do we make spaces available so that the folk who actually need to benefit from the spaces have them, right? How do we grow a crew of black artists who will eventually be the future conceptualists of this country so that they can also be part of the regime that happens here at Bemis, right? That if Bemis has a curatorial practice that they believe in and it's a high practice, how do we create uh, ways of ascending through the cultural sphere so that like one day I could have a three month residency and a little bit of cash and some space to be away from all the problems of the north side so I can just like think about my art. But if there's a gap between um, high school art and a professional art practice, who's filling it? How do we start to think about that in North Omaha? So that some of these gaps that you say, it's like, oh my God, it's so white in the beam. It's, well, that's because ain't no freaking institutions that are committed to the cultural life of black people. Now, this is a race city, or not. And I don't want to racialize this thing too much. I'm talking about like, how do we start to think about particular places and the needs of, of artists in those particular places, right? And so I'm here to leverage my cultural weight and create, stir up some ideas. That's all I'm doing. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to ask the mayor, ask Rick Cunningham, ask Jim Bay, ask Rob, ask Gerard, ask Brigitte, ask Wadi White, ask I'm trying to ask everybody, like, uh, uh, it's obvious that we've done a lot of master planning. I'd really like to see some, like, servant planning, or, like, some minor planning, or some <laughs> non-planning planning. <laughs> Can y'all see that? <clears throat> the Afro-American Sentinel. Omaha, Saturday, February 4, 1899. How do we ensure that the legacy that Jim Beatty just took on to be the president of the board of the Great Plains Black Museum isn't for naught? That in Jim's term, before he dies, because he's worried about his mortality, y'all, <laughs> that before Jim dies, that place is restored. And that ain't a black problem. And it ain't my problem. I don't live here. <laughs> and so we're thinking about space in relationship to objects and things. Because artists think about space and things. Um, are there any North Omaha artists here today? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I, I didn't even know there were any. <laughs> there are no artists in North Omaha. And I'm fine.
finding that there are artists and there are readily usable spaces. And I'm just trying to uh, uh, act as the conduit so that more good stuff that y'all want to do happens. That's all I'm here for. So I'm talking to Big Mama. <laughs> Big Mama got a pat. If it ain't patented, it should be a patented uh, uh, sweet potato pie <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> Maybe have like a drive-by ice cream parlor barbershop car wash. <laughs> you know, mixed use. A J, you know, Big Mom. We went to Big Mama's yesterday. Big Mama had a rest, a, a floor, an architecturally rendered floor plan ready for Big Mama's number two. That, that it's not that the entrepreneurial interest isn't there, it's not that the creativity isn't there, it's not that the goodwill and generosity and humanity and integrity isn't there. It's all there. We just, we just got to ask the right people. That when we have town hall meetings and we bring stakeholders in, they're just folk who are interested in the money, y'all. They're just people who benefit from the tax credits. Like maybe we've been having the wrong kind of town hall meeting. And today, since we're all here, and we're the cultural leaders of this place, and we're the folk in cultural need, in cultural want, let's talk to each other. So I'm done. I just want to say, I don't want to say nothing else. The art part. The Milwaukee Art Museum asked me to do an exhibition about a slave potter named David. Their goal was to uh, increase the number of black people who came to the museum and celebrate the work of a living African American artist. Okay. Um, we're in Wisconsin, uh, home of Kohler Manufacturing Company. How can we? So, I think I'm a pretty smart kind of artist. So I'm like, well, Milwaukee Art Museum. How can we think about um, clay and craft labor? without thinking about union workers at Kohler Manufacturing Plant. It's owned by a family. Uh, it just happens that all the workers are white. Should we neglect the white working class because you think you want to have a black show? Maybe you need to open your scope up. <laughs> and should I only make work that appeals to black people? So I did a residency at the Kohler Manufacturing Plant, and we uh, built speaker sinks. We refitted one of the speakers so that it could receive my tweeter and play some music. <laughs> that I thought, if I'm going to talk about Dave, the slave potter, and a bunch of people who I want to hear about Dave and his legacy won't come to a museum, maybe I can make some music. And then I can perform that music. Maybe I can ask other people to join me in performing that music. That, that I'm back at, I started with playing my bangs, I'm back at play. But now I'm saying, what full theaster? How can I use my full self to imagine Dave the Slave Potter? How can I use my music and my interest in musicians, my, my interest in planning, my interest in people in general, mm -hmm. in choirs? Thank you. 
The, the vocalist. These are all friends from Facebook who I invited to join me in creating a choir to celebrate Day of the Slave Pot. Most of them aren't singers. And I think I'll, I'll just start there by saying that, you know, um, what does it mean to be a potter, you know? And, and what does it mean to have a full practice? And that I think um, for so many years, being a potter meant uh, working with clay and uh, using a wheel and having a kiln. And I'm, I'm finding that my, my love of pottery has to do with um, my love for the possibility of transformation. Thanks a lot.